So before we get started, I wanted to talk about a few things. One, the support on the Blasphemous video was amazing. It's currently at two and a half thousand views, which is insane, and I thank you guys so much for that. And secondly, sorry this video took so long. There were some, let's say, unforeseen circumstances that kind of put a halt to my video creation. Alright, yeah, I was just playing Persona 3 Reload, but I'm back to working on it now, so you can expect some more videos coming soon. Hope you enjoy the actual video. When it comes to the sort of YouTube videos like what I make, there's a lot of oversaturation of it right now, and there's a lot of title formats that get copy-pasted all the time. Blank, a flawed masterpiece, the best game you've never played, and one of the worst ones, Blank changed my life. I get what people are going for, but it's just a really boring title and doesn't tell you much about what the video is actually about. But if I had to make a list of games that have significantly affected me, Hollow Knight would absolutely be near the top of that list. It's one of those games for me that I can come back to an infinite number of times, and I learn something new about it every single time I play through it. Obviously it's not a perfect game, but in terms of fulfilling what I want out of media, it hits all the marks. A nice art style, fun combat, and one of the most immersive worlds out of any game I've played. It's also a game about bugs, which is just a recipe for a sick game. I hope I can help you see what I think makes this game so amazing. Our main character doesn't actually have an official name in-game, but the majority of the community just calls them the Knight, so I'm gonna stick with that. It's specifically not the Hollow Knight, although I can understand why some people would make that same sort of Metroid and Zelda mistake. We start the game with very, very little context. The knight is arriving in the kingdom of Hallownest, and after a brief tutorial area, reaches the town of Dirtmouth. The vast majority of Hallownest is underground, with Dirtmouth lying at the very surface. There's not much to do here other than talk to Elderbug, but who cares about him? To the right of town is a well that leads into the first area, and Hallownest proper. In my opinion, the Forgotten Crossroads is a nearly perfect first area. It's dense, it connects to five other areas in various ways, and it does a great job of introducing all the core elements of the game. There's a lot that can already be done here, but I'll focus on some of the highlights. The first thing you'll likely find here is the Black Egg Temple. It's sealed off right now, but you should remember it for later. Past the Gruz Mother, which is the first sort of mini-boss, we can find this little guy, Sly. He seems to have an orange glow that makes him act weird, but he snaps out of it and heads back to Darkmouth. You'll also likely hear some humming, which leads you to Cornifer. He sells some maps for the Geo we've been picking up, which aren't very helpful, but it's still a little nice. Most of the routes in this area funnel you into this shaft. It's here where we can find the first stag station and the last stag. This fine fellow serves as the game's main fast travel system, although for right now we can only head back to Dirtmouth, but it's a little more lively now. Sly has returned to his shop and sells a ton of items we can talk about later. We can also meet Iselda, Cornifer's wife. She sells a few map-related items, but the most important is the quill. This lets us fill in Cornifer's less-than-helpful map with areas we've already explored and makes the map actually useful. Both of these shops update their inventories throughout the game, but for now we can take the stag back to the shaft from earlier. It's during this initial exploration that we'll free our first couple of grubs. They will return to Grubfather, who gives us a variety of rewards as we free more and more. It's pretty important, so I'll be freeing any grubs I can as we go. A little higher is the first main boss, the False Knight. This boss is not difficult, but I still think it serves as a decent challenge for new players. He falls through the floor, letting us finish him off and collect a city crest. This opens the way to the Snail Shaman, who gives us the first upgrade, Vengeful Spirit. We can use this to defeat our first boulder and get our first charm, Soul Catcher. This is by no means the first charm we've been able to obtain. You can even get one in the tutorial area, but it's most likely the first one gotten by most people on their first time. 
Charms can be equipped at benches to give a huge variety of effects. Benches are essentially Dark Souls bonfires. They heal you and they are where you respawn upon death. I feel like most people know enough if you care about gaming to understand the concept of a bonfire. Soul Catcher increases the amount of soul gained from attacking enemies. Soul is the main resource needed to cast spells and to heal, so getting more of it is pretty helpful. You can find a lot of dead ends throughout the crossroads that would normally lead into other areas but we just don't have the tools to get through, but we can get through one of them now that the Vengeful Spirit can defeat the boulder. This leads to Green Path and a pretty nice change of scenery. As we progress we can see this weird bug watching us. There's also this bug being eaten but he's not very appreciative when we save him. This is Zote and we'll be seeing a lot of him later. After catching up with the bug from earlier, she's revealed to be named Hornet, and has already killed a bug that looks a lot like us. Hornet is a boss that a lot of beginners struggle with. I know for a fact that trying to beat Hornet on my first time took me actually dozens of tries, which is crazy because with how much I've played the game now, I can beat her very quickly. It also doesn't help that I was playing on a laptop with the specs of an N64. She's the first boss that doesn't have a huge bulking figure, and keeping up with her quick movements can be tough. Anytime you die, you release your shade and lose all your geo, as well as a portion of your soul gauge. If you defeat the shade, you get it all back, but if you die before you can, all of your geo is gone. Again, it's the standard Dark Souls losing soul, getting your soul back. It's a pretty standard thing throughout a lot of games. Defeating Hornet makes her run off, and we get the Mothwing Cloak from the corpse. This allows the knight to do a quick vertical dash in the air. Having the dash opens up a lot, but most notably it opens up two paths to the next area, Fungal Wastes. There's a lot of important things throughout this area. Defeating these two big mushroom enemies awards a Charm Notch. We start with three of these, and the more Charm Notches gotten, the more charms that can be equipped. We can also find Leg Eater, one of the more important NPCs. Not in terms of lore, or exploration, or character, or anything else, but from the fact that he sells the Fragile Charms. Fragile Greed makes enemies drop more Geo, which is alright, but not super useful. Fragile Heart gives you 2 extra HP, which isn't applicable in every scenario, but can still be really helpful, especially early game, when that's like a 1.5% increase to your health. And finally, there's Fragile Strength. Fragile Strength is the best charm in the game. It gives a 1.5 damage increase to all of our physical nail strikes. This starts out alright with an unupgraded nail, but scales up pretty insanely quickly later in the game. All of the fragile charms have one caveat, being that if you die with them equipped, they break and you have to get them repaired with Leg Eater. However, if you're careful about it, they really do make the game a lot easier and more interesting. Farther into the waste is the Mantis Village, which of course has a bunch of new Mantis enemies. Within is the Mantis Claw, by far the most important and useful upgrade in the game. Its effect is simple, letting the knight wall jump, but it just opened up a massive portion of the game and there's a ton of places that we can go to now. But first, I want to finish up in the Mantis Village. At the lowest point of the village are the three Mantis Lords. The fight starts out with just one of them and she's not too tough, but then you have to deal with two of them at the same time. This boss is awesome, and even when you completely have them down, it's really fun to weave in between their attacks and squeeze in extra hits when you can. A lot of the time, when you get good at a fight, it loses a lot of its fun factor, but that's just not the case for this boss, and I really can't quantify how that is. Unlike other fights, the knight doesn't actually kill the Mantis Lords, instead earning the respect of the entire tribe. This makes them all passive, which allows us to get to the Mark of Pride Charm, another really good one that lengthens the reach of your nail. As our final stop in the waste, we can find Bretta. After snapping her back to her senses, like we do with Sly, she heads back to Durfmouth. This seems like a random anecdote, but she'll be important a bit later on. Of course there are some routes that are intended to be reached now that we have the Mantis Claw, but some of them are a little less intended. Like a lot of other Metroidvanias, the movement in Hollow Knight is incredibly versatile. Even without any upgrades, there are a lot of areas that can be reached early with enough ingenuity. For example, back in the crossroads, I'm not supposed to reach this area until I have the Mantis Claw, but if I pogo off these spikes, there we go. The wall jumping was pretty much just a suggestion. Now we can kill the brooding Molek for a mass shard. These are basically heart pieces from Zelda, and collecting four permanently gives you an extra point of HP. There are also vessel fragments, which do the same thing except increasing maximum soul instead of health. Another one. I can't get up without a wall jump. Unless I lead this enemy over here and boost off them for another mass shard. 
I love this sort of freedom with exploration. It harkens back to things like Super Metroid, where if you're proficient enough, you can basically go anywhere you want. People have beaten that game killing the four main bosses in the completely opposite order than what's intended. It takes real confidence to give the player such an adaptable moveset, and it adds a lot to exploring, especially on subsequent playthroughs when you know how to do more interesting skips and sequence breaks. Near where we found Sly earlier, we can dash over to Salubra's shop. She sells a lot of charms and charm notches, but more importantly, we now have the opportunity to really sequence break. If you die in this area and then lead your shade near Salubra's store, we can bounce off of them and reach the Blue Lake. We're supposed to have a lot of different upgrades before we get here, but we're here now. There isn't much to this area, but it lies below the resting grounds. While going through this area, we're trapped by three spirits, the Dreamers. These three are the ones that sealed the Black Egg Temple, and our objective is now to find all three of them and release that seal. But we're freed by the Sage, who also gives us the Dream Nail, an incredibly important item. It basically allows us to enter the Dream World while striking different beings. This has a number of uses, chief among them being needed to awaken the Dreamers. You may be confused on what's actually been happening up until now since I've been explaining everything in a very gameplay-oriented fashion. Hollow Knight has a lot of similarities with Blasphemous, the previous game that I've covered on this channel. For one, it's a Metroidvania, which is obvious, and it even has a Berserk reference. But more importantly, the main story is very vague and goal-oriented on the surface. However, there's a lot of nuance found about the land of Hollow Nest, through lore tablets and NPC dialogue. However, a lot of the story begins to come together once we enter the City of Tears. Located below the resting grounds, the City of Tears is not only one of the biggest areas in the game, but also the most densely packed. Due to being directly under the Blue Lake, it's also perpetually raining, hence the title. Not exactly the best place to build a city, but what do I know? The city is split into two main areas. The left side can be reached through the fungal waste by opening this door using the Knight's Crest obtained from the False Knight earlier. This is the place for the commoners and the bugs that are viewed as lower than the other side. You know, the Reddit users and the Twitter users. There are a few things that can be reached here, but we're blocked access to the other side of the city where all the aristocrats live, so it's better to come in through the resting grounds like I did. In the very center of the city lies a massive statue where we can meet up with Hornet again. She commends us for making it this far and tells us that if we intend on perpetuating Hollow Nest's future, that we should find her in the Grave and Ash, whatever that's supposed to mean to us. On the statue it reads, Memorial to the Hollow Knight, in the Black Vault far above. Through its sacrifice, Hollow Nest lasts eternal. Alright, I think that this requires some explanation. So Hollow Nest was built and ruled by the Pale King. He's generally accepted to have been a good ruler overall. One day, an infection began to spread. This is the orange glow around Sly and Breda and what comes out of the enemies when they're hit. The infection causes bugs to go mad and of course it fell to the Pale King to do something about it. His solution was to bring forth the Hollow Knight, to have it serve as a vessel to contain the infection. It was put in the Black Egg Temple and sealed off by the Three Dreamers. Lurian the Watcher, Monomon the Teacher, and Hera the Beast. This worked for a while, but as you can probably tell by a ton of bugs being insane and spewing infection, it didn't last long. Now the Pale King has completely disappeared and it's up to us to unseal the temple and find out what's actually happening. There's some more happening behind the scenes, but that's all we really know now. While our goal is to awaken the three dreamers, we can't actually reach any of them right now, without some sequence breaking anyway, but we still have a lot of upgrades to find. Near the top of the city we can find the Soul Sanctum. The bugs here did a bunch of experiments with souls, stealing it from other bugs and injecting it into themselves. At the end is Soul Master, and he's a pretty fun boss to fight. After a little bit, you think he's defeated and you collect your reward, but are then dropped down and have to deal with a second, shorter phase. We finally receive the Desolate Dive, our second spell. The Desolate Dive makes the knight slam down on the ground, making a shockwave in its immediate area. It does open the way through some shaky ground and works a little bit with progression, but its main use is that it gives you some brief invincibility along with dealing damage when used in combat. On our way out of the city, we can meet the Nailsmith, who can strengthen our nail for a fee. After the second time, he also requires Pale Ore, a collectible that can be found in a number of places. This is incredibly useful, not only because it increases our damage, but it also makes the damage from Fragile Strength scale even higher. There are two main ways to get to the next area, the Crystal Peaks. The first is to desolate dive through this ledge and drop into the area. The second is to purchase the Lumify Lantern from Sly and enter through this dark hallway. We need the lantern for later anyway, so I went that way. 
I think Crystal Peaks is one of the more memorable areas in the entire game. It has a completely different atmosphere and color palette compared to everything else, and I think it looks really cool. What's weird is that it's actually one of the areas with the least things to do. There's only two bosses here, the second just being a reskin of the first. Farther in is the Crystal Heart, the main upgrade we came here for. It allows the knight to rocket forward going infinitely until it's cancelled or you hit another wall. It doesn't really have any use in combat, but it allows us to go through hallways quickly and opens up a few new areas for us. Far below the city lies the Ancient Basin, which serves as a huge tone shift. The area is mostly empty and the few remaining enemies are full of infection. The color palette is also almost non-existent, seemingly having been drained of life. By using the crystal dash we can cross this large spike pit and reach the leftmost part of the area. Here lies the next boss, Broken Vessel. It's another fun one-on-one -on -one fight, but what's more interesting is its appearance. They look just like the knight, only completely overcome by infection. Why are there so many bugs that look like us? Unfortunately, the Broken Vessel doesn't have any answers for us, but we can at least put it out of its misery. Beyond the Vessel are the Monarch Wings, probably the second most essential upgrade after the Mantis Claw. And I think it's time we start finding some of the Dreamers. With the Monarch Wings, we can now access the Watcher's Spire in the middle of the City of Tears. There's some tough enemies here, but the main highlight is the next boss, and one of the toughest, the Watcher Knights. Their movesets are fairly simple, but there's six of them, with two of them attacking at a time. There's a real rhythm to this fight, and it took me a really long time to get the hang of it on my first few playthroughs. Now that I have it down though, this boss has turned from pure frustration to one of the most satisfying fights in the game. Once they're beaten, we can proceed higher in the spire and find our first dreamer, Lurian the Watcher. They're pretty defenseless being asleep and all, but we can dream nail them and kill them in the dream world. That's the first dreamer awakened, but we still have two left. Below the City of Tears is the Royal Waterways. This area is gross. I think it's pretty fun in a well-designed area, but it's gross. They're the flukes, the nasty slug things, the fluke marm, a boss that's just a treat to look at, and oh, oh no, this entire time I've been walking through. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. As nasty as his surrounding area is, I absolutely love this guy. He's silly, he's fun, he's a really fun fight, and he has a really good boss theme on top of it all. Like the Mantis Lords, he doesn't actually die when defeated, so we'll be seeing more of him later. The Dung Defender was guarding a switch which, when flipped, lowers the water in a different part of the waterway and opens the way to Yzma's Grove. We reach Yzma's Tier, which allows us to swim through acid. It doesn't really add much mechanically since it sort of just serves as a key to open the doors of acid pits. I would complain about this, but the Knight's moveset is already fun enough that it doesn't really matter too much. From the Dung Defender, we also receive the Defender's Crest. It's not really a notable charm, it just gives you a small, low damage hitbox around you, but at the very least it makes Leg Eater give you a discount on his items. And, you know, it makes you smell like that. To the left of the Fungal Waste is the Queen Station, and beyond it the Fog Canyon. We've technically had the ability to come here since Green Path, but we've never been able to actually progress without Yzma's Tear. There's a ton of exploding jellyfish throughout this area, which some people have theorized are meant to be a reference to the Metroids from... Metroid? I don't really see it, but it is weird that there's a bunch of jellyfish in a game full of bugs. Deeper within the canyon are the teacher's archives. Outside the archives we can meet up with Coral. We've met him a few times up until now, and it seems like he also has business within the archives. Within are even more jellyfish and the mother of them all, Umu. Initially we can't deal any damage to it, but in a really cool moment, Coral appears to break its outer layer making it vulnerable. Alongside Coral, Umu doesn't last too much longer. I'm going to be completely real. Quirrell showing up is a cool set piece, but it's really not a fun fight. All of Umu's attacks are really annoying to dodge, and it's really annoying having to sit around waiting for Quirrell to make his move. The vast, vast majority of bosses in Hollow Knight require you to be incredibly proactive. They aren't just going to sit there and not attack, taking your hits. They're warping or jumping around, and you have to take the initiative to take them down. There are attacks that you need to bait out to get an opening, but these mix with everything to make the boss more fun. Umu, on the other hand, is an almost exclusively reactionary boss, where you dodge attacks and wait for Coral. Reactionary bosses can work, like in Zelda for example, but I don't think they really work well for Hollow Knight. Anyway, beyond Umu, we can find Monomon the Teacher. We can't actually Dream Nailer though, as she's seemingly sealed off. 
That is, until Quirrell appears and reveals that he's actually an amnesiac disciple of Monomon and breaks the seal using his mask. He's sad to see Monomon disappear, but he seems to be at peace. We kill Monomon in the dream world, and that's another dreamer. Just one more. The final dreamer is going to require a pretty long trek, and we're going into completely uncharted territory. Deep Nest is an incredibly uncomfortable area. This video is not going to become the hidden horror of Hollow Knight or whatever, because those videos are oversaturated and kind of stupid. But it's definitely a huge change in tone. It's incredibly dark, with some areas even requiring the Lumafly Lantern to even traverse. The enemies here are probably the worst part, though. There are a lot of enemies here that are originally from the Forgotten Crossroads. They go down really quick, but sometimes they come back. And oh my god, this sends a chill down my spine. I'm not diagnosed or anything, but I have a really strong fear of parasites and bugs being inside places they shouldn't be. So this definitely gets me. Not a fan. At the very least, there are some grubs here, but... Oh god, he's too. And I haven't even talked about the most disgusting thing here. Zote. Yeah, he got himself captured again. We help him, but he's still ungrateful. Whatever, man. As we explore a little deeper, we can come across this passage where we can find another knight alive. They may have some answers about us and the Hollow Knight. We catch up with them and... Oh. This is Nosk, and evidently we aren't the first bugs to be tricked by this whole charade. Defeating Nos gets us a pale ore, which is nice, but it doesn't get us closer to the actual truth of the matter. Even farther in, we start encountering various types of spiders. They're a little tough to deal with, but nothing compared to the horror of the rest of Deep Nest. Eventually, we reach the far end of Deep Nest, the distant village. There are actually live, not insane bugs here, and they tell us to take a rest. Makes sense, given everything Deep Nest has put us through. Uh oh. The beast den is filled with spiders, but it's not too long before we can find the room containing Hera the Beast. We once again kill her in the dream world, and that's the last dreamer. It's time to find out what's happening in the Black Egg Temple. Upon returning to the Forgotten Crossroads, it's now become the Infected Crossroads. It's clear that the infection has spread even farther, to the point where it's even made the level design worse. Truly the most evil of pathogens. Regardless, we make our way to the Temple of the Black Egg and break the dreamer's seal. Inside, we can confront the source of the leaking infection, the Hollow Knight. He's definitely seen better days, but it's still a really fun fight. Partway through, the Hollow Knight begins stabbing itself. It seems like it's not in full control and is trying to destroy itself in its brief moments of sanity. Upon being defeated, infection begins spewing out and is absorbed by the Knight. We're sealed away by the chains that held the Hollow Knight, taking its role as a vessel for the infection. This is the Hollow Knight ending. I guess we were able to contain the infection for a bit longer, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. What's the connection between the Knight, Hollow Knight, Broken Vessel, and all the other similar corpses we found? What's the deal with Hornet? What's controlling the Hollow Knight? Where did the infection come from in the first place? Where is the Pale King during all of this? Hopefully all these questions will be answered in Hollow Knight Silk Song, releasing probably never. Just kidding, we still have a lot to do. What I've described is what's needed to beat the final boss and finish the game, but it's by no means all it has to offer. You may remember Hornet telling us to meet her in the Grave and Ash. We should probably do that. To the right of the City of Tears lies the Kingdom's Edge. There's a lot of stuff here, most of which is pretty helpful. Past these massive hopping bugs is the house of Nailmaster Oro. He can teach us the Dash Slash for a fee, unlocking our first nail art. These require you to charge up your nail before unleashing, but they're pretty helpful. They're not applicable for every situation, but they're good against some enemies and bosses. Near the top is the Colosseum of Fools. There are some good rewards to be gotten here, and... Zote? I can't really bail him out of this one. Near the end of the first Colosseum challenge, it builds up to this huge monster coming out, and you think it's going to be a cool boss, only for Zote to fall out. Not only does Zote get easily comboed, but he can't even hurt you if you let him. At least defeating him here allows him to get out. Finally, we can find Hornet at the far side of the Kingdom's Edge, in the cast-off shell. She can tell that we're trying to help the Kingdom, but test us before she can give us what's beyond. The second fight with Hornet is great. She has two new attacks, but her speed has also been greatly increased, making openings to attack a lot stricter. Regardless, the Knight still defeats her and is allowed to go further into the shell, receiving the King's Brand. The King's Brand can only be used in one place, at the very bottom of the Ancient Basin. We drop down into the abyss where we land on a pile of corpses. This is where all of those bugs were coming from. If it wasn't clear we were related to them, there are enemies called siblings, which greatly resemble our own shade we drop when we die. Also, they're literally called siblings, so that helps. 
In an attempt to stop the infection, the Pale King created thousands of bugs as a combination of his own children and the void from the abyss. If a child wasn't fit to be a vessel for the infection, they were abandoned to die in the abyss. That was until a suitable vessel appeared, the Hollow Knight. The Pale King took the Hollow Knight to raise him and then sealed off the abyss with the King's brand. Of course, some of them were able to find a way out of the abyss, but none of them got very far. Except for the Knight. It's never really explained why the Knight returned to Hollow Nest, but it's clear where we came from the abyss initially. At the end lies a statue from which we can obtain the Shade Dash. This allows us to pass through certain barriers, but most importantly, it gives us invincibility frames, which becomes essential for later bosses. The Shade Cloak is the final movement upgrade, and by extension, nothing in Hollow Knight is out of our reach at this point. After passing through one of the Shade Barriers, we can enter the Queen's Gardens. There are a good number of collectibles here, including the Howling Wraith, the final spell. It fires soul directly above the Knight, and while it's only useful in combat, it is very useful in said combat. The Queen's Garden is full of traitor mantises. There used to be four mantis lords, as we can see from this broken throne, but they defected and by extension became traitors. There's a ton of them around, but no sign of their leader. We can also find Cloth here. Like Coral, we've been running into Cloth throughout the game, and she's just a nice presence to have around. Past another shade barrier, we find this room and several mantises spawn. It's a little overwhelming, but our girl Cloth shows up. We make quick work of the rest of the team until the Traitor Lord appears. This boss is pretty great and is the first boss with attacks requiring the use of the Shadow Dash. It's no problem, not with Cloth on our- Wow. Can't say she didn't go out with a bang. Kloss is one of the more memorable NPCs for me, and you're actually able to keep her alive. If you beat the Traitor Lord while never having talked to her, she stays alive, but she's completely unfulfilled after having never experienced an epic battle. It's tough to say which is the better scenario, really. Beyond the Traitor Lord's area is a house containing the White Lady. She was the Queen of Hollow Nest and the other parent of the Vessels in the Abyss. She doesn't seem to know where the Pale King is, but she gives us half of the King's Soul Charm so I guess we'll have to take it. Now that the White Lady has become relevant, I can tell you that I left out something fairly important earlier. After awakening Hera the Beast in Deep Nest, you can talk to Hornet, who reveals that Hera was actually her mother. Hera was the Queen of Deep Nest, and the White Lady the Queen of Hallow Nest overall. However, there is one more queen that hasn't come into the picture yet. Hidden within Kingdom's Edge is the Hive. There's really not much here, just a bunch of bees. At the end of it is the Hive Knight who is defending the Queen Vespa's corpse, which you can see in the background. Hive Knight is an alright fight, and after he's defeated we receive the Hive Blood Charm, and, if we have the Dream Nail, we can talk to Vespa's ghost, but she doesn't say much. Sorry for the detour, but I promise this is relevant to Hornet. In order for Hera to become a Dreamer, she requested that she be allowed to bear a child with the Pale King. He accepted, and the child became Hornet. She then became a Dreamer, so Hornet wasn't able to spend much time with Hera. Subsequently, she was taken care of by the White Lady and learned to fight with Vespa in the Hive. So Hornet was birthed by one queen, raised by another, and trained by a third. This context explains why Hornet knows so much about what is happening, considering she's technically the princess of Hollow Nest. That was a lot, but I think it's necessary context to Hornet's role in the story, and I think she's one of the most interesting characters overall. It was around the time of me exploring Queen's Gardens that I found the final stag station. Upon doing this, the last stag offers to take you to the stag nest. You get a vessel fragment from this quest, and also allows you easy passage to the Howling Cliffs. There's really not a lot here, one of the most empty areas, except for the house of Nailmaster Mato. He's the brother of Oro from Kingdom's Edge and teaches the Cyclone Strike. There's one more Nailmaster in Greenpath, although he's given up the nail. Shio is now a painter, but he still offers to teach us the Charge Slash. Upon learning all three nail arts, we can return to Sly, and he tells us he's actually the one that trained the nail masters, as well as giving us a charm. This is just a tidbit for now, but it'll be relevant later. In order to find the Pale King, we'll need to get to his white palace in the dream world, but our dream nail isn't strong enough yet. In order to power it up, we're gonna need a lot of essence. Essence can be gotten a number of ways, but the most efficient way is through fighting dream bosses, which there are a lot of. First up are the dream warriors. I don't really like most of these guys. They all have the same kind of structure, just floating around and shooting projectiles at you, making a sort of bullet hell scenario. 
they really aren't fun, and they're also pretty easy. Much more interesting are the Dream Rematches. These were added in the Hidden Dreams update and are much more difficult versions of previous bosses. These include Failed Champion, Soul Tyrant, Lost Kin, and White Defender. These bosses are really fun and demand a lot more of your skills than most things in the base game. Finally, if all encounters with Zoat have been done, he'll be back in Dirtmouth talking to Breda. She's somehow fallen for him and now has a shrine in the basement of her house. Dream nailing the shrine begins the invincible, fearless, sensual, mysterious, enchanting, vigorous, diligent, overwhelming, gorgeous, passionate, terrifying, beautiful, powerful Grey Prince Zoat fight. I know there's a chunk of people that don't really like this fight, but I think he's pretty cool. His attacks are pretty erratic and unpredictable, but it's satisfying to get all of them down. Upon collecting enough essence, we can return to the Seer and receive the Awoken Dream Nail. With this, we can finally enter the White Palace. There are a few enemies here, and they're sort of tough, but that's not the main challenge. As you ascend, the Knight will have to deal with one of the hardest bits of platforming within Hollow Knight. There's thorns, spikes, and buzz saws everywhere, so sustainability is pretty important. However, at the very end, we finally get the opportunity to confront the Pale King, after he abandoned the kingdom and hid away here. And he's dead. So much for taking responsibility. He does, however, drop the second half of the King's Soul Charm. But that's not all that the White Palace has to offer. We still have to do the Path of Pain. This was added in the Grim Troop update and is by far the hardest platforming challenge in the game. It requires a lot of knowledge of Hollow Knight's movement and I'd be lying if I say I didn't enjoy it at least a little bit. The only reward for finishing the Path of Pain is a short cutscene with the Pale King and the Hollow Knight, back when they looked a lot more like the Knight. With both halves of King's Soul equipped, we can return to the Abyss and view the birthplace cutscene. As vessels fall into the depths of the Abyss, the Knight climbs in an attempt to escape, as text fades on screen, the words of the Pale King. No cost too great, no mind to think, no will to break. No voice to cry suffering, born of God and void. You shall seal the binding light that plagues their dreams. You are the vessel. You are the hollow knight. King Soul transforms into the void soul charm, and we ha finally have the last piece of the puzzle. The vessel needed to contain the infection needed to be perfectly empty, with no mind, no will, and no voice. When the hollow knight was chosen, it was taken by the pale king to be raised and trained to be a proper vessel. However, as we can infer from the Path of Pain, the Hollow Knight developed a fraternal connection to the Pale King. The infection has been leaking into Hollow Nest because the Hollow Knight still has some form of emotion remaining. We have all the tools we need, and I think it's time for the Knight to save their sibling. Upon obtaining Void Soul, two more endings become available. Before you would normally finish off the Hollow Knight, Hornet swoops in, restraining them. You can keep attacking the Hollow Knight, knocking off Hornet and finishing them, the ending is similar to before, only now Hornet is also trapped inside the Black Egg Temple. It seals with an emblem of Hornet's face on it, implying that she's now become a dreamer. This is the Sealed Siblings ending. Probably even worse than the Hollow Knight ending to be honest. However, there is one more option. During the Hollow Knight fight, it's normally impossible to dream nail them. However, with Hornet restraining them, we can enter the dream world. We now have the opportunity to confront the source of the infection, and the one controlling the Hollow Knight. The Radiance. The Radiance works really well as a true final boss. They have a huge variety of attacks, several which require the Shadow Dash. After the first section, the Radiance is engulfed by Void Tendrils, but escapes higher into the air. The boss is similar now, but with slightly different attacks and no floor to support you. It's a pretty tough fight and one of the hardest thus far, but still manageable. Don't worry though, this isn't the last we'll be seeing of the Radiance. After the second section, it escapes again. We give chase, avoiding lasers as we try to reach it. We can also see dozens of the siblings from the abyss rising up with us. Upon reaching the top, we give one final nail strike to finish the fight. The radiance is once again enveloped by void tendrils and torn open by the shade of the hollow knight. The knight sheds their shell and finishes the radiance off in their shade form, finally destroying the infection. Void flows out into the temple and when Hornet comes to, she sees the broken shell of the knight. The siblings gaze to the top of the abyss and then sink back into its depths. That is the Dream No More ending. There are a lot of things left unanswered, but it's a very satisfying end to the story of the Knight, the Hollow Knight, and the Vessels. But we still aren't done. After release, Hollow Knight received four major updates. 
Lifeblood was the most minor one, having several balance changes as well as a few additions such as the Hive Knight. The Hidden Dreams update added the previously mentioned Dream variants of old fights, as well as Grey Prince Zote. But there's still two major content updates to discuss, the Grim Troop and Godmaster. I'll talk about them in release order. In order to begin the Grim Troop questline, this corpse in the Howling Cliff must be Dream Nailed. This makes the Nightmare Lantern appear, which summons the Grim Troop to Dirtmouth. Upon entering, we meet Troopmaster Grim, who will give us the Grim Child Charm. Using this, we can collect flames from enemies throughout Hollow Nest. Collecting three flames allows Grim to upgrade the Grim Child, and unlocks the next set of flames. After doing this twice, upon returning to Grim, he challenges you to a duel. This is the first new boss to the DLC, and it's one of the best. All of Grim's attacks are very fast, and he's constantly teleporting around. Since he's vulnerable at all times, the fight really feels like a dance between the two of you. There aren't many places to catch your breath, so it's pretty exhilarating. You've been hearing it during this section, but his theme is also incredibly good. After defeating Grim, we receive a Charm Notch, and can go get the last three flames. While I do really like Grim, the flame collecting is really not fun. They're all super out of the way, and the enemies you have to fight are either really uninteresting or really frustrating. But it's all fine, because the reward is completely worth it. Upon returning to Grimm's tent with all the flames, he won't actually be there. However, we can access the back room now, where Grimm can be found sleeping. Upon dream nailing him, we can enter the dream world and face Grimm's true form, Nightmare King Grimm. I'll be up front, this is by far my favorite boss in the game. Take everything I said about the initial Grimm fight and turn it up to 10. It's a real challenge and definitely the hardest boss thus far, but that's what makes it so fun to go back to. You have to react to his moves in the exact right way, or you'll definitely feel the consequences. And if Grimm's initial theme was good, oh my god, this one is insane. There is one other way for this DLC to go, though. During the third round of Flame Gathering, you can find Brum, a member of the troop. He wants to get rid of the Grimm troop, and if you help him, you can destroy the Nightmare Lantern and banish the Grimm troop forever. You do get a different charm from doing this, but in my opinion it isn't worth missing out on the amazing fight that is Nightmare King Grimm. The final update to be added to Hollow Knight was Godmaster. In the far corner of the Royal Waterways can be found the Junk Pit, and a coffin within it. After opening the coffin, the Godseeker falls out, dropping the God Tuner. After defeating any given boss, they'll be tuned to the God Tuner, but they're still added if defeated beforehand. Dream Nailing the Godseeker allows us to enter God Home. This area serves as a boss rush mode, split into four pantheons. Most of this is previous bosses, but they each have one new one at the end, so I'll discuss those. The boss of the Pantheon of the Master is a dual fight with Nailmasters Oro and Mato. This fight's pretty fun, and I think it's cool how they both use their given nail arts. It's not too tough, but it's fun enough. The Pantheon of the Artist has Paintmaster Shio. This fight is really fun and unique, and I like it a lot more than the previous one. Depending on the color of Shio's paintbrush, he choreographs different attacks. I just think it's fun to react to the color and quickly figure out what you're going to do. The Pantheon of the Sage has Nail Sage Sly. I've seen a lot of people not like this fight, but I think he's still pretty fun. His attacks are incredibly fast and erratic, and he's one of the smaller targets out of all the bosses. He also has a second phase where he shoots around the screen, and I don't like this one nearly as much. It just winds up being really annoying or not that interesting. Finally, the Pantheon of the Night has the Pure Vessel. This is what the Hollow Knight was meant to be, free of infection and at full strength. This fight is awesome, and by far the best boss added in God Home in my opinion. The Hollow Knight is also really fun, so speeding it up and tweaking his attacks make it even better. After completing the Pantheon of the Night, one final challenge is unlocked, the Pantheon of Hollow Nest. This requires you to fight through every single boss in the game, in a row, without dying. That means all the story bosses, all the dream warriors, all the optional bosses, all the DLC bosses, without dying once. It's incredibly tough. But once you defeat the pure vessel at the end of the Pantheon of Hollow Nest, you aren't done. The ceiling opens up and you hear a familiar screech. The knight is teleported away, and now we have to face the final challenge Hollow Knight has to offer, the Absolute Radiance. This fight is brutal. The Radiance was already tough, but this is ludicrous. Everything is faster, deals 2 HP of damage, and keep in mind, if you lose this fight, you don't just have to restart the fight, you don't just have to beat Pure Vessel again, you have to do the entire Pantheon of Hollow Nest again, and all of the bosses it contains.
I won't lie and pretend like this didn't take me a while in several attempts, but once the Radiance is beaten and the Laser Climb is finished, what took only one hit before is now its own phase. Thankfully this phase has a lot less HP, but the nerves of getting this far still makes it pretty tough. Once the Absolute Radiance is defeated, a monster of Void emerges from the night and completely obliterates the Absolute Radiance. Void begins seeping out into God Home and then into Hollow Nest. Hornet is shown confronting the Hollow Knight and then that's really it. This is the Embrace the Void ending. There is one more, but it just involves the Void coming out of the God Seeker being contained and doesn't give much more clarification. There are a lot of unanswered questions, but hopefully we'll learn more about it in the future. After achieving any ending, you unlock Steel Soul Mode. The only notable change to this mode is that if you die, you can't reclaim your shade to recover. Your save file is instead broken and you can't try again. You effectively have one life to beat the game. It's a pretty tough challenge, but I don't have much more to say about it. It's a permadeath mode, it's pretty difficult. Hollow Knight is one of the closest to a perfect piece of media that I've encountered. It achieves absolutely everything it wants to, and even more. The story it tells is one of my favorites, and I genuinely believe that it's the current pinnacle of the Metroidvania genre. Trust me, I've tried a lot, but I've yet to find a game that so wonderfully captures what makes this genre great. Its art style is beautiful, its world cohesive, and its gameplay incredibly satisfying. It's really altered the way that I view other games, and it's just amazing. If you haven't played it, I really hope this video convinced you to give it a shot, or I was at least able to properly explain what makes it so great to me. Like, subscribe, do all the YouTube things. See you next time. End slate time. This is by far my longest video, and I want it to kind of be the longest video for a while, because this is a lot. Um, I know the next video will be shorter, that's for certain. Uh, Hollow Knight means a lot to me, so I hope that this video comes out well and is an enjoyable watch because, you know, the game is an enjoyable play for me, and I hope that I can adapt that work into, you know, something entertaining for you guys, so. Uh, there should be videos on the screen if you want to watch my other content, and see you guys next time.